Shavuos is coming up, and on Shavuos, obviously, everybody knows that it's the time that we receive the Torah. And there are different aspects of the day. There's the study, the all-night study session people engage in. There's the chesed, kindness, the aspect that we learn because it's the anniversary of the death of David HaMelech, who comes from Rus, the convert, who was the ancestress, and she got what she got because of the kindness, the chesed that she engaged in. A lot of different aspects of people focused on the cheesecake because uh, Har Sinai is called Har Gavnunim. Gavnunim is closely related to the Hebrew word Gvina, which is cheese, for those who like cheesecake. So there are different aspects of the day. Oh, the receiving of the Torah, receiving of the Torah, everybody knows there's a, an intriguing statement in the Talmud. The Talmud says in Tractate Shabbos on page 88, God held the mountain over the Jewish people like a barrel. Omar Lahem, he said to the Jewish people, If you accept the Torah, very good. If not, that's where you're going to be buried. Now, if you think about that statement, um, the plain meaning is obviously that it implies some sort of what we would think of as a threat. Uh, commentaries explain that it wasn't literally that the mountain was over their head. It was that the, so obvious that they should accept the Torah that it was as if it would be as obvious as somebody who's standing under a mountain and somebody's threatening him. That's the approach, the standard approach. I want to take it to a slightly different place today. Kafalevis Harkigis. You know, when you upgrade, imagine the following. Imagine that your, uh, your sister comes running into the house and she says to you, you know, I was outside. She's in a panic and in a sweat. She says to you, I was outside, and this cat was chasing me. And to me, the cat was like a leopard. That's how afraid I was. So I understand the analogy, and I understand it's only a cat. But she's telling you, to her, it seemed like a leopard. Okay, that I understand. Could you imagine she comes running into the house, and she says to you, you know, I was being chased by a leopard, but to me, it seems like a cat. That doesn't make any sense. If that's the case, then you shouldn't be afraid. Now, let's take it to what the Talmud says. He held the mountain over them like a barrel. The Jewish people at Har Sinai, according to the Talmud, saw something no one in history has ever seen. You know there are mountain climbers, there are people who climb what they call extreme sports. People engage in uh, rappelling and rock climbing and that sort of thing, dangling off of various cliffs. The highest mountain climbers and adventurers have never seen what the Jewish people saw at Har Sinai. They saw the underside of a mountain. Could you imagine? That means they're the only people in history who were ever looking up and saw, oh, that's the underside of a mountain. Now, if somebody wanted to emphasize the threat, I would say God held a barrel over the Jewish people, but they were so terrified that to them it seemed like a mountain. But the way the Talmud puts it, God held a mountain over them like a barrel. That's the opposite. I mean, what, what happened over there? They looked up and said, oh, <laughs> it's only a mountain. Uh oh, it's a barrel. You understand? That does not seem to make any sense. So the idea is like this. It's a very, very deep and intriguing idea. The idea is, if you took a mountain and you hollowed out the mountain like a barrel, imagine somebody inverted a barrel, they're holding a barrel over you, and you hollowed out the mountain and then lowered this mountain, which is hollowed out, you lowered it over somebody, what would happen? They'd be trapped inside the mountain, isn't that true? Yet, if you're inside a mountain, on the one hand, you can't get out. On the other hand, Nothing could get in, number one. Number two, when we go back to that statement in the Talmud, the Talmud says, God said, if you accept the Torah, good, mutav. If not, shom teik furasem. That's where you be buried. Question number two, why does it say that's where you'll be buried? If you drop a mountain on somebody, you know, in modern Hebrew, in Hebrew there's shom, which means there, and po, which means here. Now, if you drop a mountain on somebody, are they sham or are they po? They are very, very po. You don't get much more po than having a mountain dropped on you. So when it says sham take furaschem, there, why there? Here you'll be buried. And the answer is that if a mountain is hollowed out like a barrel and it's lowered down over a person, on the one hand, you can't get out. On the other hand, nothing could penetrate to get in. God's saying to the Jewish people over here and the Talmud is communicating to us, the nature of Torah and what it does for a Jew. If you accept the Torah, mutav, good. It's the best thing you could do. It's the best way you could possibly live. 
Ve'im lav. If you don't want the Torah, the Torah looks like it's got rules, regulations, restrictions, demands, and people are hesitant to embrace Torah because of what it looks like. You don't want the protective device of the mountain with all of the restrictions and rules, yet it's a protection for you. You want what's out there, that world, shom tehei kvuraschem. That world will bury you. That world with its vulgarity, with its lack of rules, with all of the licentiousness, that world will bury you. So I once heard about a couple in Los Angeles. The husband got into his BMW, and the wife got into her, her Lexus, and they made a suicide pact. The two of them apparently were not happy with life, in spite of being able to own a BMW and his Lexus. They made a suicide pact. They came driving around the block at about 90 miles an hour and crashed into each other. They didn't die because the airbags activated. They couldn't even commit suicide properly. But the, the rule, the idea that here we are, we basically have everything the material world has to offer, so why are they committing a double suicide? Shom teik furasem. That world with its emptiness and that world with its lack of values and distorted and twisted ideas, shom teik furasem. That world will bury you. It says, everybody knows that when Yaakov Avidu gave a bracha to Ephraim and Menashe, the bracha was the yidgu l'rov bekerav ha'aretz. The yidgu l'rov, they will be like fish. Now we don't have a Hebrew word that fits the word v'yid gurlov is translated as they will proliferate like fish. If we wanted to use one word in English, we'd say they would fishify. And the commentaries ask, well, why are they compared to fish? Why are Ephraim and Menashe compared to fish? The commentaries explain. If you take a look, if you're standing by water and you see fish, you know, I think everybody has at some point or other had a daydream. I wonder what it would be like to be a bird and to fly. We can imagine that. You know, birds just look like us and all they have wings. And everything is similar, but they're just a little different. And I'm stuck in traffic once in a while. I daydream about what it would be like to be a bird and have wings and be able to fly. To think about what it's like to be a fish, you know, fish live in a completely different element. They breathe water. If you've ever imagined what it's like to be a fish, and I will make a personal confession, in uh, moments, in certain moments of loneliness, uh, if I've been on a bus or a line at a bank, once in a while you start daydreaming, maybe in a shear, I start thinking about what would it be like to be a fish and imagine myself breathing water and I end up coughing because just thinking about breathing water, we can't relate to fish. When Yaakov Avinu gave the bracha to Ephraim and Menashe and he said to their father Yosef, he said, the bracha was v'yid gularov the care of arts. They will be fish on land. They'll be fish in the middle of the earth. You know what that's implying, what the idea is? The idea is the same way that when we look at a fish, if you ever so watch a fish in an aquarium, I know sometimes I see fish in an aquarium, I think to myself, hey, don't you guys work? What do you do all day? And we cannot imagine or connect in any way, shape, or form to the world of a fish. The same way the Torah is telling us, Yaakov will say, you shall be like fish, the other nations see us. Can they possibly imagine what a Shabbos is? It's not just the people sitting around and enjoying a good meal. Can they possibly imagine what a seum on the daf yomi is? 50,000 or 100,000 people celebrating the culmination of studying. Could you imagine a whole group of people getting together? We finished, finally finished Encyclopedia Britannica. We're making a mass celebration. Or Harry Potter, we're making a mass celebration. And here you have a bunch of people who to the outside world, okay, you finished studying something. You're making such a mass celebration. V'yidgu l'rov, you'll be like fish. They can't imagine what a Torah life is. Somebody once said, there are two pleasures that no non-Jew in the world will ever be able to experience, which Torah Jews do. One of them is, if you've ever been in shul on a Monday or Thursday, as the chaz and the shleach tzibor, when he gets to the point, he says, hamvareches amo Yisrael bashalom, and there happens to be a bris or a Chosan and Shul, and they give a clap, say, Kaddish, and there's no Tachnun that day. <laughs> you look around the Shul, all of a sudden, oh, no Tachnun. That's one of the pleasures. That's a joke. There's another pleasure, which is a hot piece of potato kugel on Erev Shabbos. I think that's a, almost every husband, father, male in the world 
On Arab Shabbos, you have a hot piece of potato kugel. It's absolutely delectable. There is one other pleasure, which is that second piece that my wife doesn't want me to take, but that one, that one's really even delicious, more delicious. It's the stolen waters are sweet. The Torah gives us so much joy, so much pleasure, so much fulfillment, and that's the Yid Gularov, the care of Aretz. That's what that mountain over the Jewish people symbolizes, but it's more. The Talmud says that Rav Yosef, the great Amora Rav Yosef, Talmud in Psochim on Daf Samaches 68b, and I will read it to you. The Talmud says that Rav Yosef on Shavuos, he would say, please prepare on Shavuos, Rav Yosef would say, Avdi li igla tilsa, make me please a steak from a three-year-old calf. That was the finest cut of meat in those days. Omar, why? Ilav hayoma de kagorim, if not for this day, Shavuos, where the Torah was given. Kama Yosef ika b'shuka. How many Yosefs are out there? In other words, the only reason, and Rashi, the great commentary Rashi says, if not for this day, Shalomadati Torah, I studied Torah. Vinisro Mamti, and I was elevated as a result. Hare Anoshim Harbe Bashuk Shishman Yosef. There are many people out there named Yosef. Uma Beni Levenam, what difference would there be between me and them? Interesting, isn't it interesting? Yosef in English translates usually to Joe. I'd just be another Joe. And here of Yosef, the great Amora of Yosef, says, if not for Torah, that changed me, elevated me, refined me, I mean, I'd be like everybody else out there. What they're telling us is, what we're celebrating is that when a man studies Torah, connects to Torah, it changes him. And it doesn't have to be all day longer studying in Kolo. That's certainly a wonderful thing. But a man who connects to Torah is going to be a different man. That's what the Torah does for us. Ilava Yoma, Kama Yosef Ika There is a, um, the Mir Yeshiva here in Israel. Every morning, anybody who's ever seen it, there are bus loads, literally dozens of buses that bring Avrechim, Kolel fellows, from all over Yerushalayim. They bring them to the Mir Yeshiva every morning. Bus loads, bus loads, thousands arrive at the Mir Yeshiva. And one day, one of the bus drivers, a secular Israeli bus driver was driving, and he got pulled over by a policeman. And the policeman gave him a ticket, and he got back on the bus, and he was not happy about it, and he started going off about, well, I just got a 250 shekel fine for a nitpick, and this guy's having a bad day, and takes it out on me, and he's going on and on. In the meantime, one of the Kolo members on the bus, he turned to the guy next to him and said, do you have five shekels? Do you have five shekels? He went around the bus. There are 50 guys on the bus about. He collected the 250 shekels and he gave it to the bus driver. How come you've never seen that on any other bus except the beer bus? Because Torah takes this young man and it elevates him. Could you imagine? Have you ever seen an Israeli bus driver speechless? Could you imagine? That's what Rav Yosef is saying. If not for Torah, I'd be like everybody else. The Torah elevates us. It refines us. It creates a different person, whatever the connection is to Torah. But I heard from the Rosh Hashiva of Or Sameach, Rav Mendel Weinbach Zatzal, years ago he said another take. He had another insight, another take on this Gemara. He said, when Rav Yosef said, Kama Yosef Ika Beshuka, how many Yosefs would be out there, he was really speaking about himself. He was saying that if not for Torah to give me direction, if not for Torah to give me a focus, if not for Torah to give me goals in life, I'd be all day. You know how many of me would be out there? It's what we would call a fragmented personality. One day I'd be trying one form of entertainment. The next day I'd be looking for something else to do. A third day I'd be looking for yet another thing to do. Maybe gambling and maybe various addictions and maybe various inappropriate behaviors. Kama Yosef Ikebeshukah, I'd be a fragmented personality. What is it that gives, grounds me and gives me focus and direction? It's the Torah that gives me the focus and direction. I once had a student whose father was very wealthy. And the student himself told me that his father was not a very, very uh, 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 focused person at all. And he told me that when he was in his early 50s, he was bored with life. He was extremely wealthy, and he was bored with life. 
So much so that his wife, obviously the wife of a bored man, is probably not very happy herself, and she suggested that he should take a vacation and go to Bolivia. Could you imagine Bolivia? Listen, let's face the facts. If I gave you 10 minutes to find Bolivia on a map, you probably wouldn't be able to find it, except if you played Risk. Okay, yeah, that's why I know it too. We, we, we all played Risk, we know we're Bolivia. Otherwise, nobody would be able to find it. She tells her husband, take a vacation to Bolivia. That's what you need to do, that's the point you get to in life. You've got money, you've got real estate, you got it, and you're bored with life. And you know what this man's name was? His name happened to be Yosef. Isn't that ironic? Kama Yosef, he could be shook. He'd be all over the place. He even got to go to Bolivia. That's what Rav Yosef is telling us. Rav Yosef is telling us that is what Torah does for us. My, my, my brother happens to live in a place called Telstone. A small town here in Israel, just outside, about 20 minutes outside Yerushalayim. And one night, saw a young man with a suitcase standing on the sidewalk. My brother was on his way to shul. And this young man says to him, excuse me, and he picked up a French accent. He said, excuse me, could you tell me where 21 Eliyahu Hanavi Street is? And my brother said to him, well, there is an Eliyahu Hanavi Street, but it's in B'nai Brak, it's not in Telstone. And he said, no, 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 I'm in Bnei Brak, and I need number 21, Eliyahu Anabi Street. My brother said, well, I've been living here about 30 years, and uh, there is no Eliyahu Anabi Street here, but there is an Eliyahu Anabi Street in Bnei Brak. What turned out was that this young man, this French visitor to Israel, had never been here before. He flagged down a cab driver, an Arab, and he told him he needs 21 Eliyahu Anabi Street in Bnei Brak. Well, the cab driver sensed that he didn't know where he was going, dropped him off in Telstone, which is about halfway to B'nai Brak. He pointed to a building. He said, that's 21 Eliyahu Novi Street. The young man got out of the cab, pulled out his baggage, and while he was, to make matters worse, he had left his suit jacket draped over the seat, and the Arab helped himself to his wallet as well. So my brother brought him into his house, and he gave him something to eat, and he sent him on his way. I thought about that story. I realized, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to get badly lost. The Torah gives us direction. The Torah says, this is where you're headed. You're headed in a certain direction. It gives us grounding and it gives us focus. That's what Rav Yosef is getting to. On Shavuos, they brought an offering in the base of Migdash. What was the offering they brought? The offering was called the Shtei Halechem, the two showbreads that they brought to the base of Migdash, the Shtei Halechem. And these Shtei Halechem correspond, interestingly enough, to the two basic physical drives that a person has. What are those physical drives? In order to understand this, we have to go back to another statement in the Talmud. The Talmud asks, what does a person do? How do we occupy ourselves on Yontif? What do we do on any given Yontif? Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuos. What are we meant to do to occupy ourselves? So there's a discussion in the Talmud and the Talmud says, well, you have, one opinion is you spend half the day studying, chatzi la Hashem, you study and you daven, and you pray. Half the day is la Hashem, devoted to God, what we think of as the more spiritual pursuits. V'chatzi lachem, half the day you spend eating and drinking, enjoying. There's another opinion that says, no, you get to choose. Either all day for Hashem, you could spend the entire day of Yontif in a base medrash, davening, studying, everything spiritual, or all day lachem. Those are two opinions in the Gemara. And then, remarkably, the Gemara makes the following statement. The Gemara says, everybody agrees that on Shavuos, you have to spend at least half the day. Now, most people, when I've asked them, what do you think, what's, what's at least half the day doing what? Most people will tell you, at least half the day has to be la Hashem. Most people will say, sure, we got the to Torah, spirituality, half the day la Hashem. That's not what the Talmud says. The Talmud says half the day of Shavuos has to be lachem. You have to spend half the day enjoying the physical pleasures. Isn't that remarkable? And Shavuos, when the Torah was given, that's the day we have to spend, enjoy the physical pleasures? The answer is that's exactly what the Talmud's emphasizing. When we accepted the Torah, the Torah, most people think, 
Yes, the religious Jews, they made some sort of deal with God. They'll sacrifice the various pleasures of this world for some sort of abstract spiritual pleasure in the world to come. I don't know, I think it'd be farther from the truth. The Torah teaches us how to enjoy this world. And that's why there's the shte halechem on Shavuos. The word lechem, which is bread, obviously represents food in the most basic sense, lechem. But when Mrs. Potiphar made her advances to Yosef HaTzadik, the Torah refers to her as lechem, which is obviously an allusion to the area of morality and immorality, the area of the pursuit, that physical area of life. Those are the two most basic physical pleasures, and it's the shtei halechem and shavuos that we bring, which we pay tribute to the Torah, because the Torah is what teaches us how to control and enjoy the physical pleasures of life without those pleasures dominating us. That's why we bring the Shtei Alechem on Shavuos. The Shtei Alechem is symbolic of the overall benefits of Torah. That Torah is something that allows us to enjoy this world. And then, after we live a Torah life, we then have the rewards of the world to come. Tamu uru ki tov Hashem. The Pasuk says, taste it and you will see that Hashem is good. Very difficult for us to relate, sorry, for somebody outside of the Torah world to understand how can I live a life of restrictions? How can I live a life of rules and regulations and yet enjoy life? So I will conclude with an interesting story that I once heard from Rav Zev Lef Shlita. You know, there was a king running through the forest. He was being chased by the bandits. And the bandits were hot on his trail. And the king in the forest, he saw a small little hut towards the back of, at the end of at the forest. And he runs into this little hut. And he says to the guy, quickly, hide me because the bandits are after me. The guy says, listen, I don't have a lot of place to hide over here. But if you go in the back room, there's a very wide bed. Crawl under the bed, get as far against the wall. Maybe they won't see you. A few minutes later, the bandits come running into the room coming into the hut, and they go searching the hut, and one of the bandits goes into the room where the bed is, and he takes his sword, he looks under the bed, he can't see anything, it's very dark in the corner, he takes his sword, he pokes it as far as he could under the bed, looks at the point of the sword, there's no blood there. Sword comes within an inch of the king's nose. He pokes it again, and the king is like looking at the sword, and he pulls it out, and again, no blood, he turns around and he leaves. A few minutes later, the search party, the entourage, enters the room. Search party comes in, pull the king out, and the king turns to the owner of this hut, little hut, and he says, listen, you saved my life. You get to ask for anything you want, anything at all. The guy says to the king, really, anything? He says, I'll tell you, I don't have much, but there is one thing I'd like. I'd like to know what was going through your mind. What did it feel like when that sword was an inch from your nose? And the king explodes in rage. He says, you insolent fool. You could have had anything. You could have had wealth. You could have had honor. You could have asked me for anything. You saved my life. In that nonsense, that's what you asked for, I sentence you to immediate execution. And they bring out the big portable chopping block. And he brings out the big guy with an ax. And he slams the guy's head on the block. And he says, at the count of three, violently knock off his head. One, two, don't chop. The guy looks up, and the king smiles and says, that's what it felt like. I wasn't really upset. But you asked me, what does it feel like to be an inch from death? How could I possibly explain? The only thing I could do is put you in the same situation. When you actually experience it, then you could see what it's like to be an inch from death. Doesn't feel so good, does it? Tamuru kitov Hashem. A person sees Torah, Torah learnings available, a life of rules, organization, goals. That's what provides the fulfillment in this world. That's peroseyim ba'olam hazeh. The hakeren kayemes la'olam haba. That's what Shavuos is about. A reminder of tamu uru kitov Hashem. Hi, this is Peretz Baruch Eichler a proud alumnus of Orson Mann. Now what you just watched 
is one of the many programs that Orsa Mayak provides, leaving its impact on hundreds of thousands with so many more waiting to be reached. Orsa Mayak Central Campus in Jerusalem has over 300 students presently learning there. And now you can be a vital part of spreading that bounty of knowledge worldwide by logging on to donate.ohr.edu. We can step up to the plate at this pivotal moment of Warsaw Math's growth and bring the next generation of Jews home.